Father, we come before you. We pray your word would again open to our hearts. We have seen these things before in Kings. But Lord, as we go through again this, uh, this rise of Israel to, in many ways, the zenith of their domain, it is only a taste of what's coming when your son, the son of David, sits on the throne and all nations will gather to him. And there the joy is not gold becoming commonplace and silver as those stones, but the joy is that souls have come to worship and been redeemed. We pray, Father, you'd open the word to our hearts and let it have, Lord, just the power of the Spirit to touch our lives and to change us and to help us to grow. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, possibly from the shipping exploits we talked about that were going on at Zion Geber or modern-day Elat, going down the Red Sea, there's some discussion. Is she from Ethiopia? Is she from Saudi, the Arabian Peninsula there? There's some discussion. You can study it for yourself. But the fact remains, this lady, this queen, came to visit, having heard of the fame of Solomon. And she came to prove, and by the way, what very important source verified she's a true historical figure? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the Queen of Solomon came to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and yet there is a greater than Solomon here. Jesus verified this is a, indeed an accurate account. God in human flesh let us know she's a real person. She truly did come visit. Those little things you think of, Matthew 12, 42, Luke eleven thirty one. 31, just keep those in mind because there God gives us again from his own mouth confirmation of his scripture. The queen of Sheba heard of the famous Solomon. She came to prove Solomon with hard questions. Now, in the, and when I say oriental, okay, this is the writers of the 1800s calling it this, but in the, the Eastern culture, looking toward the Orient, they enjoyed riddles and enigmas. Why? Well, they don't have cable, XM, satellite, Sirius, DVDs, VHS, 8-track, you know, reel-to-reel, smoke signals. They don't have much of anything. They, they really sat around, and so riddles and enigmas were big to them. And that was something that they would go back and forth. I can give you an example. A man leaves home jogging. He jogs a little while, and he turns left. He jogs a little while, and he turns left. He jogs a little while and he turns left. And as he approaches home, there are two masked men waiting for him. What happened? Where is he and what has happened? Want him one more time? How many want him one more time? Okay. A man leaves home jogging. He jogs a little while and he turns left. Let me see if this helps you. He jogs a little while and he turns left. Jogs a little while and he turns left. Jogs a little while and turns left, and when he comes home, there are two masked men waiting. The catcher and the umpire. There's an enigma. Okay, or a riddle. There you go. So now, yeah, see, the uh, crazy pastor giving these screens. You know you're all going to do it tomorrow at work. Hey, check this out. See if you can solve this. So she came to prove him with hard questions at Jerusalem with a very great company. Camels that bear spices, gold in abundance, precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon, no matter how hard she asked the question. He was able to solve it, or basically to unlock it for her. That's impressive. She's blown away by this. He told her all that was in her heart. Solomon told her all their questions. There was nothing hid from Solomon, when he, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built and the meat or the food of his table, the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel, his cupbearers also, and their apparel, his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her, this from Jameson, Faustin, and Brown, in Solomon's daily progress to his gardens and pleasure grounds, he was accompanied by a numerous retinue of riders who were young men in the flower of their age, eminent by their, uh, by their tall and handsome figure, with long hair on their shoulders, with gold dust sprinkled in their hair, 
and expensive purple clothes and fancy armor and bow. That was his entourage. Perhaps, well, never mind. No, 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 never mind. I'm just not going to do it. My kids learn that when I start laughing and I keep my mouth shut, they know something's bouncing around in my head. They're like, what is it? That, nope. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. This one's not leaving. This one stays in here. Anyway, when she saw all these things, she was literally just no more spirit left in her. She was over, just overwhelmed. And she said to the king, it was a true report which I had heard in my own land of thine acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not their words until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half of thy greatness of thy wisdom was not told me, for thou seedest the fame that I heard. Now we have a few slides. We have those ready back there, folks. Uh, one is when she came with a very great number of camels in her retinue there with all the spices and gold and other things, according to our archaeologist guide Edo, a large caravan could have up to 500 camels. 500. So, and this, uh, that, that's a couple of sample caravans there. The ones that are sitting down, that's at Petra there in Jordan. You can go see them for yourself if you'd like. Uh, but that's the idea. And then here is an artist's rendition of the throne we're going to read about. We'll just do it now. So here's this throne overlaid with ivory with six steps. You know, we think six steps, we think this little like up to a stage, but the idea is that it was impressive in size and layout. So here's someone's rendition of the Queen of Sheba ascending to Solomon's throne. While we're on the subject, the reason this is important for his location, next one please, he is sitting on the top of essentially some major trade routes. Going down to the Red Sea opens up to him, uh, the southern continents there. Also going up through the north opens up to him, Europe, next one. And then obviously working to the east opens up to him, access to the Silk and Spice Roads. He's sitting really at the crossroads of much of the trade going on at that time, which is why it is very easy for him through either, t either tariff or controlling those territories, which he did with his chariot cities, his horse cities like Megiddo. This is how he could increase his wealth very quickly. And by the way... This is how the news of his wisdom would also spread quickly. Think about this. Roll the clock forward to the time of Christ. There at the Sea of Galilee, you're really at the very heart of these routes again. And so the miracles, the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ literally happens in the heart of the world, so to speak, at that time. And with the Roman road system and the Roman you know, occupation, so to speak, or the Roman dominance at that point of their empire, it has opened up the ability for the gospel to go all over the world. God knew what he was doing. Okay, so back to our text. Thank you for the slides. So she said to him, verse 6, you know what, I didn't believe the words till I came and saw it. Man, it's not even the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me, for it exceeds the fame that I heard. So verse 7, happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. They're getting a free education. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on his throne. By the way, where is the source of Solomon's greatness? It's from the Lord. He gave him the position. He gave him the wisdom which he asked for, which was a good choice, and has blessed him. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne, to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God lovest Israel to establish them forever. Therefore he made the king over them to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, 144,000 ounces of gold. You can figure out the fair market value. 20 talents of gold, 120 talents of gold, and of spices, great abundance with precious stones. Neither was there any such spice as the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. And the servants also of Huram, the servants of Solomon, which brought gold from Ophir, which we talked about last week, kind of being down, we think, either the Saudi coast or in Egypt, or the southern part of Egypt, brought algum trees and precious stones, or all the way down, brought these things to them. That's like a, a red sandalwood, very durable, uh, very desirable. He used it to make not only um, porches, but also musical instruments. We'll get into that, but most think it's the red sandalwood tree today. It grows about 20 feet high, used for making instruments even to today. Strong and beautiful, black on one side, red on the other. 
made all the algum trees, of them he made terraces. Of the house of the Lord, of the king's palace, harps, psalteries for the singers, and there were none such seen before in the land of the king of Judah. And King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked. The Ethiopians, and I've confirmed this with an Ethiopian who sat next to me at the Bible College, they have a tradition that that included leaving pregnant with an heir. You might say, <gasps> well, the guy had a thousand wives. So if she asked that she might leave pregnant with an heir, that would be, mm, you know, okay. And because of that, that tradition has held even to modern times that there is a line of David that runs through the Ethiopian kings or through Ethiopia, and that gives rise to several things. How many have heard of Bob Marley? No, how many heard? Few people know Bob Marley. Just kidding. He is a, or had been a Rastafarian. Okay, there are some rumors he got saved on his deathbed. We'll know for sure when we get to heaven. Who knows? Rastafarianism is the belief that a, I believe a circa 1940s prince, Rastafari, was the Messiah. In other words, Rastafarianism is preaching a false Messiah which is why after I got saved and began to really understand what was going on, I, the Bob Marley music, and instead was able to get blessed by a band like Christ of Farai, which preaches Jesus. What a blessing. But that came from that idea that Solomon and the Queen of Sheba produced an heir, and that heir went down to, again, the area where Sheba was from, and there continued along independently of what was happening in Jerusalem, so much so that there's another tradition that as the Priesthood could see the kingdom falling into apostasy. They actually shipped out the Ark of the Covenant to this line. This is all what's out there. To this line of David supposed through the Queen of Sheba down in Ethiopia. And that is why, if you've ever seen the account, that there's that church in Ethiopia, that compound that claims they have the real Ark of the Covenant. They never let anybody see it. There's one guy in charge. He claims he's, he's the one who sees it. And so how many have ever heard this? No, okay, it goes on in the news once in a while. They need a new roof on the building. That's come up. There's been some rumors lately that proved to be a hoax of some things that happened. But you'll hear about it once in a while that people claim the Ark of the Covenant's in Ethiopia and is being guarded in that sense by this tradition. Where is the Ark for real? Well, if we knew that. <laughs> uh, most feel Jeremiah actually hid it underneath the Temple Mount. And there are some accounts there, and there's actually one rabbi claims who has seen it. Ron Wyatt, since we're on the subject, I'll just put it out there. Saying, well, he didn't mention Ron Wyatt. Okay. Ron Wyatt claims that it's in what's called Jeremiah's Grotto, which is just north of the city, out kind of past the Damascus Gate to the area of the Garden Tomb. And Ron Wyatt claims he found it, tried to photograph it. It would not show up in a negative because that was before digital cameras. And he claims that actually the blood of Christ's cross actually anointed the Ark of the Covenant. Those are the stories out there. I'm sticking most likely with what Jeremiah, we think, did, and that is left it underneath the Temple Mount. Why? Because when they go to Babylon, it's not mentioned, and it's the most important piece of furniture that was in that temple. When they come back from Babylon, it's not mentioned, yet they tell us how much the gold weighed, what objects, they told us a lot of things, but they never mentioned the Ark of the Covenant. So it would be very interesting. There are those who claim the Israelis already know where it is and that they're waiting until the right time. When would the right time be? when they have finally access to building a third temple. Is there going to be a third temple? How do you know? Because you told us on a Sunday. No, how do you know? Because Daniel chapter 9 tells us there's going to be this Antichrist who will confirm a covenant with many for seven years of one week. And in the midst of the week, he cuts off offering and sacrifice. Israel's in the land. There is only one place that can be done, and that has to be in Jerusalem, which means we need a third temple. Ezekiel also mentioned these things to us. As you get into the end of Ezekiel's prophecy there, he describes the measurements of that third temple and the layout of it. There's going to be a third temple. Well, are you kidding? Do you know how, look, the, the Jordanians are screaming that they're letting Jews up there, and, and now they're, they're arguing, they're throwing stones and rioting about what's happening on the Temple Mount, and are you nuts? Well, you know, that would be one way to pull off a peace agreement. Allow the Jews to finally build on the Temple Mount in exchange for other things. Does that sound far-fetched? Not really. 
Trick question. Who has control of the Temple Mount? Uh, uh, uh. Jerry, I think you got it if that was you, Jerry. Israel has control of it. Well then, but who's administering it? The Jordanians through the Waqf. It's called the Waqf, or the Waqf. The Jordanians were given the, the custodianship of the Temple Mount, but in 67, when the Jews again took over Jerusalem, they had it under control. Remember the guy with the eye patch? Moshe? Diane, Diane good, just checking. Diane and others, when they went through the Moshe Diane, they said, listen, we, we've, we've done enough here. We've, we've shown that we can have strength. So rather than continue to stir up the, the Arab world, let's let them have control. He was not a believer. Let's let them have control of the Temple Mount. And so that's when Israel allowed custodianship to go to, in this case, Jordanians. But they're the ones ultimately in control. That's why they can shut it when they want. They can open it when they want. They really can do what they want, but they've been doing this balancing act with the Arab world. And you can see what happens whenever that little thing has a hiccup. You can see the problems that come from it. But anyway, we're supposed to be in Second Chronicles, so let's keep going with that. And thank you. Now the wait. Oh, by the way, she turned and she went away to her own land, she and her servants. And so there you go. And again, Matthew 12, 42 mentions this uh, exchange. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Interesting number. 666. Unlock it for us. I will when we're in heaven. Because <laughs> right now... It just is interesting. Beside that which I could go all over the road with this, but I would just be wrong at this point. So beside the chapmen and the merchants that brought, all the kings of Arabia, the governors of the country, brought gold and silver to Solomon. And King Solomon made 200 targets, the idea is decorative shields here, of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went to one target. And 300 shields he made of beaten gold, about 3.75 pounds to 5 to pounds, depending on whose shekel you use. So it's it's got some real weight to it. Can you use these for battle? Why not? Gold's not. Yeah, there you go. Gold is soft. So these are decorative. 300 shields he made of beaten gold. 100 shekels of gold went into one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory. We showed you one artist's rendition there on the screen. Overlaid it with pure gold. Great throne of ivory overlaid with gold. There were six steps to the throne and a footstool of gold, which are fastened to the throne and stays on each side of the sitting place. Two lions standing by the stays. Twelve lions stood there on one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not like made in any other kingdom. And all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were all gold. All the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver, for it was not anything accounted of in the days of Solomon. For the king's ships went to Tarshish, far west towards Spain, with the servants of Huram. And every three years, once again, bringing ships of Tarshish, bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. Who else tried to take that route? Jonah, good, good answer. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Then all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon. Dignitaries came to visit to hear his wisdom. Notice that God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver, vessels of gold, raiment, harness, spices, horses, mules, a rate year by year. What do you get the king that has everything? Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots, 12,000 horsemen, which he bestowed in the chariot cities like Megiddo with the king of Jerusalem. And he reigned over all the kings from the river, even unto the land of the Philistines. That river would be the Euphrates. And this is, again, in his reign, it's, it's not completely fulfilling what God had promised to Abraham because though he put some of these people under tribute, they had not been completely assimilated into the nation. That will be done during the millennial reign in fullness as far as being completed as territory. He reigned, it was close, it's a type, but it's not fullness. He reigned over all the kings of the river, even from the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. 
And the king made silver in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar trees he made like sycamore trees that are in the low plains in abundance. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt and out of all lands. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, which we had read in 1 Kings, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet? And in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, who we'll talk about in a minute, and in the visions of Ido or Edo, the seer against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Obviously sources we don't have, but were available at the time. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay, how many have read Ecclesiastes? Oh, good. What was he worried about when he was talking about handing off his kingdom? Handing it to a fool. And what happened? He handed it to a fool. Okay. I want to read to you. Uh, well, yeah, I'll read to you. This is from 1 Kings 11. You don't have to turn there. It's going to be short. But it came to pass at that time, Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem. That the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment. Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, serving under Solomon, helping in his projects. He was industrious. Solomon made him, rule, Solomon made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph, tribe of Ephraim, Ephraimites. And he had a new garment, and as he was going out, Ahijah the prophet caught the garment, ripped it into ten pieces, handed ten pieces to Jeroboam, and kept two. And Ahijah said, thus saith the Lord, the Lord is going to tear the kingdom from Solomon because of his worship of Milcom and Chemosh and the gods of the nations around them. Solomon having these foreign wives in the hill of shame south of the city of Jerusalem there, there in that valley of Hinnon up the hill, there let them set up some of their altars and shrines. They began their pagan worship and over time Solomon would cave in and join them. And so God, in his judgment, takes the kingdom out of the hands of Solomon, who the Lord had appeared to twice and warned him, you must continue in my law. And so having warned him twice, yet Solomon still disobeyed in spite of all that wisdom. And so now Ahijah the prophet comes along and says, Jeroboam, you're going to be king. You're going to get 10 tribes. Solomon and his lineage will retain two tribes. And so once it became known to Solomon, which leads me to think, Perhaps Ahijah delivered the two pieces with a rebuke. Solomon wanted to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam was forced to flee to Egypt. Okay, that's the background. Now chapter 10, 2 Chronicles. Rehoboam, Solomon's son, became king. He went to Shechem, for to Shechem will all Israel come to make Rehoboam king. Interesting, that's where Joseph's bones that were embalmed were placed. That's where Joshua would gather the nation, having taken the land. There were still some mop-up exercises, but took them to Mount Ebel, Mount Gerizim there, and they gave the blessings and the curses, if you remember all that from Joshua. And so they're reminding the people they needed to walk with the Lord. How many remember what Joshua said? As for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose ye this day whom you will serve, right? Choose life. Okay, that speech happened at Shechem, this town. That's where Joshua gave the final charge, so to speak, to the people and said, listen, he had been warned. You're going to do what you want, but you know what? For me and my house, we're going to serve God. That's where that speech happened at Shechem. Interesting. This is where Jacob, on the way back into the land, finally gathered all the false gods that were among his entourage that Rachel had taken, hid in the camel luggage, sat on top on Laban, came back to find them. Remember all that? If you don't know all this, go read it. It's good. It's really good. You know, no, I can't tell you. We don't have time. You have to go read it. That all happened. He buried him under an oak tree at Shechem. Other things happened there too, but we don't have time to cover it. Rehoboam went to Shechem. This is a place that has national history to attached to it, where the nation began in the beginning, reminding themselves of the blessing and the cursing. He went to Shechem. And to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. It's his coronation. Ta -ta -ta. Ta -ta -ta. You know, the whole thing. Coronation came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt. Why is he in Egypt? Solomon wants him dead. Who is he? One of Solomon's labor leaders. He thought that was new. When he heard that Rehoboam had come to pass, that he was king, he came from whether he had fled into the or from the presence of Solomon. 
from the king because he had heard that Jeroboam reigned, or sorry, Je uh, let's try it again. Came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon, the king, heard it that Rehoboam was being made king. That Jeroboam returned out of Egypt and they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam saying, remember, he's in charge of the house of Joseph, the Ephraimites and Shechem is in that territory. They brought him back. He's their rep. So we got a labor dispute at the coronation. They came and they said to Rehoboam, now, this is interesting. You know, everybody's there. King's coming forward. The royal king is coming forward. And he sits down and they're picking up perhaps the crown. They're about to, time out. Hold it, king. King, we have a little thing to discuss here. Just, just a minute, please. Stop the clock. Uh, listen, we're organized labor, okay? And we want to let you know that we're tired of your projects. We're tired of being taxed like out the nose. And so we want some changes. That's at the coronation. Set the scene up in your mind. Your father, verse 4, made our yoke grievous. Therefore, ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of your father. We built the temple. We built his palace. We built all these other things that we've had in his projects. His heavy yoke has been put on us. We, you know, so just lift it, okay? Lift, ease somewhat the grievous servitude of your father. Lift his heavy yoke that he put on us and we'll serve you. How does that sound? Are they saying they don't want a king? Are they saying they reject his rule? What are they saying? Reduce taxes, basically. <laughs> You're taxing the daylights out of us. That's not new either. He said to them, come again unto me after three days. Give me three days to think about it. Coronation delayed. Let me think about it. And so the people departed. And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give me to return answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people. What a concept. If you be kind to this people, please them, speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. Okay, thanks very much. But he forsook the counsel of the old men. Whose choice was that? Don't miss this, okay? Rehoboam's made a decision. He forsook the counsel of the old men, took counsel with the young men, the young pups, punks, which were brought up with him that stood before him. He said unto them, What advice give ye that, I, that we may return answer to this people, which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke of thy father did put, that he did put upon us. And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but thou, but make thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shall you say unto them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. You know, you're, what is one of the strongest muscle groups on your body? Quads, your thighs, right? That's, I mean, you know, you get, anyway. My finger's going to be stronger than that. Stricter than my father's loins, stronger. Whereas your father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips. I will chastise you with scorpions. The debate is actual scorpions or a whip that has other things in it that was nicknamed the scorpion. You can read the historians. Whatever it was, it was a dumb answer. Keep the main thing the main thing. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day. Okay, so coronation, take two. As the king bade, saying, come again to me on the third day. And the king answered them, Roughly, jump in a lake. What we got here is a failure to appreciate the gravity of the situation. G. Campbell Morgan, how many have heard of him? Wrote an amazing commentary on this. This one volume commentary. Listen to this. Despotism, as in despot. Despotism is seldom transmissible. That Solomon had been an autocrat and had ruled with a hand of iron under the velvet is evidenced by the words of the men of Israel. Thy father hath made our yoke grievous. If this is a startling suggestion, history testifies to the likelihood of its correctness. Some of the worst tyrants the world has, some of the worst tyrants of the world 
have robbed the people of their rights. I just want to read you from history. Some of the worst tyrants of the world have robbed the people of their rights, kept them passive by the deadly drug of gorgeous displays. So did Lorenzo de Messini in Florence. So did our own Charles I. With the death of Solomon, men breathed anew and discovered their chains. This was the occasion for a bid for freedom. Jeroboam returned from Egypt to be spokesman of peace. Rehoboam showed his folly in taking the advice of the hot-headed youths of his court. He attempted to continue the despotism of his father, though he lacked his father's refinement and ability to fascinate. Interesting. The result was immediate. The ten tribes revolted. The nation was riven, or, you know, riven in twain. And judgment by purely human calculation, Judah was on the verge of war, which would have ended in her defeat. But then God interfered. No human folly has ever been permitted to continue long enough to thwart God's purpose. Nice. Good little reminder here. Well... He answered them roughly. Verse 14, he answered after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. And again, most likely hyperbole here going on. So the king hearkened not unto the people for the, what was this? Verse 15, the cause was of, what does it say? The cause was of who? Try that again slowly. The cause was of God. Okay, now let's review verse 8. He forsook the counsel of the old men. Who made the choice? Rehoboam. Who determined this was going to go this way? God. Who made the choice? Rehoboam. Who determined it was going to go this way? God. Pastor, why are you doing this to us? You're driving us crazy. Here is God's sovereignty crisscrossing with Rehoboam's free will. God had determined to bring judgment upon the nation because of Solomon's lapse into idolatry. He's not going to take all the tribes away, as Ahijah told him, because of his mercy to the house of David and David's faithfulness. But God has shaken up the kingdom because they're going in the wrong direction, and yet Rehoboam made his decision that brought about the very will of God. In other words, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows exactly which way things are going to turn, and yet we still have to make our own decisions. It is mind-blowing, the plan and the nature of God. If God be for us, so what are we worried about this evening? Even the weirdest things that men try to do to you or the people of this world try to do to you, you know what? Don't panic because you know what? There's nothing that's going to happen that your father isn't allowing for his own purposes, whether to show you as a witness to others or he's got something better and you never would have moved. So now he's moving you. And the whole thing, ah, ah, you're dragging your heels and whining, complaining. And meanwhile, he's going, would you, I got something better. Well, King hearkened not to the people that the cause was of God, that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite. So before it ever happened, God prophesied it would happen. God determined this thing would happen, yet Rehoboam made his decision. Go home and blend that in your brain. And when all Israel saw the king would not hearken unto them, what a knucklehead. Just lighten our burden. We're yours. The people answered the king saying, mm -hmm. well, what portion do we have in David? <laughs> no coronation. Coronation denied. And all the people left. We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. See you around, buddy. David, see to your own house. And so Israel went to their tents. But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Hador Hadoram, that was over the tribute, by the way, back in 1 Kings 5.14, we were told he was in charge of the forced labor. Okay, what are they upset about? The labor. Who does he send to try and smooth things over? The lightning rod to the labor. Anybody get the sense he's not quite up to par with his father's abilities? Anybody? Anybody catching that? Is it? I know what we'll do. We'll send the guy who used to oppress a lot of them for work. 
Let's see what he can pull off. Let's see what happens. He sent Hadoram over the tribute to the children of Israel, and they stoned him with stones that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot, apparently along for this, and flee to Jerusalem. I'd say coronation rejected at this point. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered of the house of Judah and Benjamin, there's that second piece of the garment, a hundred and fourscore thousand men, a hundred and eighty thousand chosen men, which were warriors to fight against Israel, the northern kingdom, that he might bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, who we hear about repeatedly in this book, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith the Lord, you shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house. So while the, the upper kingdom was just getting established, things are all in chaos, Rehoboam figured, I'll strike now. I have control of the military. We know what we're doing. We already have government established. So we'll strike now and force them into, again, a union of all 12 tribes. The Lord says, no. You shall not fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house. This thing is done of me. There it is again. And they obeyed the words of the Lord. Good thing to do. And returning from going against Jeroboam. Ezekiel prophesied in the last days, Ezekiel 37, Israel will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. It will be one united kingdom. And the name of their prime minister is? Benjamin Netanyahu, who is the one ruler over the nation. Another prophecy fulfilled in your lifetime. Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem, built cities for defense in Judah. He built even in Bethlehem. How many have heard of it? A few of you. Etam, Tekoa, Beth Zur, Shoko, Adullam, Gath, Merashah, Ziph, Adaram, Lachish, Azekah, Zorah, Ajalon, Hebron, which are in Judah and in Benjamin fenced cities. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them, in the store of victual or food and of oil and wine. And in every several city, he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong. So they're fortifying, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel, now you have to think northern ten tribes, resorted to him from all their territories or coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession, their thrust out of their inheritances, and they came south to Judah and Jerusalem. Why? For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off, threw them out from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. Well, what are they going to do? Jeroboam instead ordained himself priests for the high places and for the devils. The occult practices and fertility and idol worship. And for the calves which he had made, two golden calves, what two cities are they in? Dan and Bethel. If you've been with us on a trip to Israel, we go to the actual city of Dan. We go into the gates, which they've dug out and found. We go through the city gates. We go up, and there is an, a steel outline, a metal outline of that altar of that high place that was to that golden calf. And what Ahijah the prophet had warned him is, if you will walk before me with a, with a perfect heart like my servant David, then I will establish your kingdom. But if you turn from me and worship other gods, know that I will surely wipe out your kingdom. It was basically what Ahijah had warned him. What does Jeroboam do? He was afraid that when the people would go back for the three feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and Sukkot, or Tabernacles, when they would go back to Jerusalem to worship, as they got back there and would see the temple and be in fellowship, they'd say, why did we divide? And that they would kill him and throw him out as king. So in fear of that, he set up the golden calves in Bethel and Dan. He said, these be thy gods, O Israel, that brought you out of the land. And they began to worship these calves under the so-called desire of worshiping Jehovah. They set up these false golden calves and idolatry continued to creep in with it. And then he set up his own corrupt holiday. One month after tabernacles, he had his own. He threw the priests out, many of which went back down to the south. And he created his own priesthood for a corrupt system of worship that was designed to ensnare the people and keep them away from the true and living God. Satan doesn't care if you go to church. Satan doesn't care if you're moral. Satan doesn't care if you're a deist. What Satan cares about is if do you believe that Jesus Christ is the risen son of God who shed his blood in human flesh to redeem you from your sin. That's what he's against. 
You can be churched all you want. You can be as religious as you want. He is more than happy to let you be involved in all those things. But you come to the knowledge of the way, the truth, and the life that is only found in Jesus of Nazareth. Now he goes to war. And perhaps that's where he found you. That's where the Lord found you sitting in a church where you were churched. You were going through the motions. You were doing your thing. And then one day, suddenly... It hits you upside the head. Wait a minute. It's not just about trying to be a good person. It's not about attending. It's not about giving. It's not about doing things so people can see I'm a nice guy. It's I need a blood atonement because I am a sinner and I am destined for God's judgment. I need to repent and I need Jesus. That's what he's against. So Jeroboam set up a false system. Question, church of the last days. What do we expect to see? A false system. Christian system, which will have what is essentially a false Christ that deceives the whole world. They that dwell upon the earth are going to marvel after him. There's going to be a falling away. There's going to be this departure that comes from the truth. Men will bring in secret, secretly men will bring in damnable heresies denying the very Lord who purchased them. These are the hallmarks of the last days. A lukewarm church that is not holding to the word, that is denying Jesus' name, both in action and in stance, that looks like they're godly, but have absolutely no power. So as Israel had a corrupt system that now gets in full force under Jeroboam, and it will lead ultimately to their destruction, so what we expect to see is a greater so-called ecumenical movement where there's a watering down of the truth, there's an embracing of, you know, basically we all bust out, sing kumbaya, we throw our Bibles under the bus, and we all become this world church that has nothing to do with the risen Christ. That's where the world is headed. Let me know if you see any hints. Yeah, it is almost every day. I got people who send me, like, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, here's an article, here's an article. It's great because some of them catch things I don't, you can only catch so much. And it's like, man, here it goes again. Look at this statement. Look at, it's going on like mad out there. 18 years ago when we got started, it was a different ball game. But now it's, it's uh, part of the reason I haven't been bringing articles lately, there's too many. It's crazy. Oh yeah, we're in Chronicles. Let's see here. Where, uh, oh, yes. So he ordained, verse 15, chapter 11. He ordained for him priests in the high places, for the devils, for the calves, and this absolutely destroyed the northern kingdom. And let me tell you what this is. Out of fear of consequence, Jeroboam created the worship of God on his terms. If I really live a sold-out life, I might get fired. If I live a sold-out life, I might end up in some camp somewhere being re-educated by my government. If I really live a sold-out life, I might be mock, scoffed, rejected by my family. If I, the fear of man, brought forth a corrupted system, worshiping God on their own terms, and had nothing to do with them. Yet Jeremiah, who stands for truth, calls the nation into account for their sin, Yes, spends a night in the stocks because of Pasher and others who put him there. Yes, went through some difficulties being put into that cistern, the miry clay. But you know what? When they destroyed the city, the walls were breached, the Babylonians came in. When the whole thing went down the tubes and he was being let out in chains, Nebuzaradan said, take him out. Set him free. Because he prophesied through his God of the things that came. And he received his life as a prize even though literally at the end, almost this whole country was against him. The Lord knows. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. In a great house there are many vessels, some for honor, some for dishonor. If any man cleanse himself from the latter, dishonor, he will be a vessel that is easily used for that master's house. Therefore, Paul writing to Timothy, flee youthful lusts. We are in a time when this country has lost its moral compass. It has lost what is right. There is no longer, in a sense, even rule of law or rule of different division of government branches and their function. We really have begun to throw everything out the window as to what is, in a sense, what is right. And in proclaiming tolerance, 
we are suddenly the problem because we believe God has created Adam and Eve, male and female, and this is what God says is a marriage that produces fruit. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. These things should be crimes, and now they're becoming endorsed. These are things that the world is losing its focus on. And we're in the way. We're a problem. But don't panic. Because when it really gets dark, God is going to take us home. Fear not those who can kill the body, Jesus said. But rather fear those who can not only kill the body, but cast your soul into hell fire. Well, they set their hearts to seek the Lord. These Levites and priests, they, they left this whole thing, this false system. We're not going to be part of this. We're out of here. By the way, I often encourage people who are going through struggles, listen, this is only a test. And they say, well, how do you know? I say, simple. If it had been an actual emergency, we would have been raptured. The rest are tests. He ordained him priests for the high place, for the devils, for the calves, which he made. After them, all the tribes of Israel set such their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel. They came to Jerusalem. Now the nation begins to polarize, to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah, made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. For three years, Rehoboam, they walked in the way of David and Solomon. They followed the Lord. David did better than Solomon. You know this. Remember, the Chronicles is essentially a quick run through history for the Jews returning. You want some of the real bad details? Go back to Kings. You'll get the full story. But here, at least he's doing the right thing in the beginning for three years. But after he seemingly gets established, look what happens. Then Rehoboam took Malahath, or Mal Mahalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, to wife, and Abihail, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse, which bare him children, Jeush, and Shemira, and Zaham. And after he took her, or after her, he took Maka, the daughter of Absalom. Actually, we believe this is a granddaughter. Absalom had a daughter. Her name was? Named her after a sister who was raped, Tamar. So this seems to be Absalom's granddaughter through Tamar. Maka, the daughter of Absalom, granddaughter, which bear him Abijah and Atai and Ziza. There's a name. Probably don't have in the rest of the kids' lunchboxes. Ziza. Shelomith. And Rehoboam loved Maka, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. For he took 18 wives and threescore or 60 concubines for a total of 78. Not the thousand his father had, but not one man for one woman for life either. Remember what Jesus said? Moses allowed these things because of the hardness of your heart, Matthew 5, Matthew 19. But I tell you from the beginning, it was not so, for God created them male and female. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Jesus took us back to God's intent. One man for one woman for life. And by the way, the world's idea is a great lover, the Don Juan, so to speak, of the world, is a man who is with many women over the course of a lifetime. But however, you look at your Bible... What your Bible tells you a great lover is in a man is one man who can satisfy one woman through all the changes of her life. That's what God intended. And there's a richness and a beauty that comes in that relationship with time between them. So 78, 18 wives, three score concubines. And he begat from this came 28 sons, 28 sons and three score daughters, 60 daughters. So 88 kids from 78 wives. It's nothing. That's 1.2 kids per wife. <laughs> Do the math with our family. And for those who don't know, yes, we have a number 11. We gave away maternity clothes. We gave away everything. And just before I took her to Israel, she found out she was pregnant. So she had jet lag, insomnia from the first trimester, and smells drive her crazy. And guess what the Middle East is full of? Smells. And 105 to 110 the Dead Sea Valley. She doesn't want to go back. <laughs> She's okay if I go. She doesn't want to go back. We're going back in June, God willing. But, but with those numbers, I calculate, uh, I think it's 858. 78 times 11, 858. 1.2 kids. What? Anyway, so just, 
Just a thought. Rhea Boehm, I can't come home tonight probably either. I have to sleep on somebody's couch because now I'm being trouble. Your husband said, what was he thinking? Well, come on, you know you were thinking as soon as I brought up the numbers. Like, these people, that's nothing. We were sitting in a Bedouin tent last year. And the guy, uh, we were, and this was interesting. Did I, did I tell you guys about this? Okay, we're in the Bedouin tent. We're there, southern Israel. And he's, he has three wives. So you can see the ladies in the tent going, what? And the guys were like, what? And so a question was asked, when you got your second wife, how did your first wife feel about this? Now, I'm quoting, so don't storm the stage and beat me up, okay? He said, oh, it was great, because once I got the second wife, the first wife started being nicer and taking better care of herself. <laughs> you could feel in the tent the women going, oh, let's kill him. <laughs> He was looking for a fourth wife. She was hoping she'd be, say, 18. And I think he had, what was the number? Who, anybody remember? 20, 23 sons? Something like that? 20-something. 20, some, 20 and somebody in the tent was like, that's nothing. See that lady over there? She's got 10 with that guy. And that's one wife. And he's like. <laughs> it was a very interesting cultural experience that evening. I just simply report. That's all. Rehoboam made Ahijah, or Abijah, sorry, the son of Makkah, chief, to be ruler among his brethren, for he thought to make him king. And he dealt wisely and dispersed all of his children throughout all the countries of Judah, Benjamin, unto every fenced city. So he basically doled them out for other people to take care of, to cut down on rivalries and intrigue and murder and all the other things that can happen. And Rehoboam desired him many Wives. Where's that going to take them? What did the Lord warn them not to do? Don't multiply horses. What did Solomon do? Multiplied horses. Don't multiply gold and silver. What did Solomon do? You've read the account. Don't multiply wives. What did Solomon do? <laughs> Went way beyond it. What is Rehoboam doing? More of the same. Why? Because it will take your heart away from God. And that's exactly what happened. Well... It came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself and thought he had arrived, guess what he did? He forsook the law of the Lord, and sadly, leadership does matter, and all Israel went with him. But we're out of time, so we'll have to pick up that train wreck next week, God willing. Let's pray and let's stand. Father, we come before you and we thank you again that it is through the blood of Christ that we have redemption. If any man confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, he is of Christ. It's that shed blood that satisfies the law of God. It's that sinless life that made him a sufficient sacrifice. There was no spot, no blemish, no iniquity in him. So then the Lord could lay upon him the iniquity of us all. Lord, I pray for anyone this evening here or listening that doesn't know you. Would they please, Lord, finally understand. May that journey be made from their head down that 18-inch path to their heart that it is not enough to, ch to be churched, but they must be born again. And there's only one who can birth them. That is you by the Holy Spirit. If the Lord is tugging on your heart this evening, I pray that you would open your heart to him. You would ask him right where you stand to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart, be your Lord, be your Savior, that you would live a life that is in submission to him for his glory and for your blessing. Lord, help us as a church to not only know your word, but to be doers of it. Thank you for all these things, and thank you that you will save whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord. May we abide and abide well in these very strange days. In Jesus' name, amen.